Hey everybody, welcome to the Fundamentalist Podcast. We're back and better than ever. My name is Elliot Morgan and I'm here with Peter Rollins, a Northern Irish philosopher, theologian, public speaker, and all around uh, good gentleman, Bitcoin aficionado. Yes, yeah, that's uh, that's what this episode's going to be about. It's all Bitcoin. Yeah. We're going to tell you guys how you can get rich quick <laughs> on the internet's currency. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been trying to do it for 10 years, and this Pete figured it out ahead of everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's th- going to be big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you to everybody also for listening to our most recent podcast, The Fog of War One, all about the impending civil war, big tech related to Bitcoin and all the other, other crazy stuff that's going on right now. I almost just gibberished there for a second, so I apologize. It's been a, it's been a day. It's been a t- crazy, crazy time. Pete, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm feeling yeah. feeling well. I should probably put my mic oh, out yeah, a little faces bit closer. you. Yeah, but yeah. I like maybe next. Anyway, we'll figure yeah. it out. It's a work in progress, guys. Uh, yeah. Anyway, if you would like to subscribe to this podcast and see it visually, you can do so at youtube.com slash Elliot Morgan right here. Or you can go to iTunes if you prefer the Audible route. And you can subscribe on iTunes, maybe even leave us a review if you like that kind of thing. You can um, give us money on uh, the Fundamentalist at Patreon. Yes, the Fundamentalist Patreon. That. We don't. I yeah. think, is it live? I don't think I've made it live. There's, yeah. It's coming. It's well, coming. No, you, you made one like six months ago. Six months ago, which, yeah. Not live yet. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always a scary yeah. because it's we, like you imagine. You know, we want if, it to be a certain level before we ask anybody for anything. Yes, yeah. before we go into sheer panic. But uh, saw some of y'all's comments about stuff, and it's coming. We'll figure it out. But it'll be a very low key thing that uh, you know we'll we'll add some cool content to, especially as I'm learning more stuff in school, and Pete continues to learn stuff just because he reads all day every day, and yep. he's just getting smarter <laughs> and smarter. That's a good win win situation. Yeah. Um, this particular episode. Because we are strictly academic, we're strictly materialistic and mechanistic here on this podcast, we are talking about the scientific form of exorcism. Not really. We're talking about the real kind of exorcism, along with uh, madness and going crazy and and, and what that feels like, what it is, what's happening within you, and what the deal is with uh, all those demons that are floating around inside all of us sometimes. Um, Now, this was your idea, Peter. So I've pretty much exhausted. I have some thoughts but you, I think, have good thoughts. So let's dive, let's start there. Okay, well, yeah, I thought about this because in my youth, when I was uh, late teens, uh, I briefly was a bit of an exorcist type person, did did a few exorcisms. We are off to the races, (laughs) three minutes in. (laughs) Yeah, not many people know that, actually, that's funny. Uh, Yeah, I I did exorcisms when I was briefly part of a religious group that I converted into, so I wasn't religious when I was young or anything like that, I got into this group. And then, yeah, we did we did some exorcisms, and uh, I'm interested in what was going on because there's something you see when you see somebody undergoing an exorcism. Um, the, the people often, they experience a too muchness in their body. There's something that is within them that is too much. That a demon. A demon, yes, absolutely. <laughs> they yeah. explain that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they have to get Seems out. like there's something going on <laughs> in that person. Yeah, so there's there's this feeling of uh, utter intensity. There is this primal agony, and there is this too muchness. Something has to be pushed out of the body. Yeah. And that's interesting to me because that is an experience that, I mean, all of us can relate to to some extent, but if someone has a psychotic structure... That's that's an experience that is very real, mm-hmm. right? So um, I thought, oh, that would be an interesting topic to talk about. What is what is it when someone feels a too muchness? So about ten percent of people listening to this podcast will be able to hopefully go, oh, I felt that. I know what that feeling is, and I thought I, we we could unpick it, and then that would draw us into some really interesting topics about uh, what psychosis is. I love what when our that? topics will relate to at most 10% of the audience listening. Yeah. I think that's going to be absolutely perfect. <laughs> we just narrow it down as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you say too muchness, like that's yeah. a very um, vague, yes, maybe softer term than what I've I've seen some weird stuff, man. Like I've, I don't know. I would love to see a side by side comparison of sort of what I've seen in more charismatic churches in Florida versus like what you saw in Belfast. Cause mm. it's, um, it sounds so similar. Uh, and I, I remember I've seen, 
the most I can remember seeing, I never, I don't think partook in an exorcism. It's so funny to talk about this so casually because it sounds so insane, which I guess is the point. But um, I remember like flashes of a memory of a pastor traveling, maybe evangelical pastor or something who would in a very small room on like a Wednesday night with a packed crowd walk around and direct people to um, if they felt something off, if they felt something turn in their stomach when he walked past them, uh, that that could be a sign that they had a demon in them and that they needed to come A lot forward. of women feel that around you. All the their time. Well, there's a lot really of turned, restraining. Yeah, yeah a lot yeah. of orders. Since I mean, I, that's why I'm just calmer mm-hmm. now. I got too much... There's a siren going off now, so it sounds they're coming for me. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, it, that's the most I think experience with like straight up exorcisms. But when I I think when people think of exorcism, they think of the Catholic um, image of in the movie, uh, the exorcism movies, and they think of the cross and the you know holy water and all that stuff. Yeah. Did you have that? Yeah, well, look, it didn't have the, all of the um, accoutrements, but I uh, did see some kind of very dramatic experience i remember one guy and it was in this room and this room oh good no yeah not this room <laughs> this room in <laughs> belfast wednesday yeah and it looked like somebody had got a shotgun and just shot him because his whole body went back Isn't and that crazy he, he fell he went back about five or six feet smashing through all of these chairs and bam onto the ground yeah. sums up something's going on I, yeah the way people move uh, when they're experiencing these things is inhuman. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, it's not like that was such an unnatural movement. Yeah, it was I like, fascinating. I like too that the idea of an exorcism is such an extreme thing and people are like, that's such, no, it's no such thing as exorcism. That's crazy. But when you see it, like it makes perfect sense that back in the day people would be like, this is a possessed person. Yeah. There is yeah. a too muchness in there. And, and, and there's, there's so many, like there's, uh, there's people possessed all over the place, so there's socially acceptable uh, exorcisms. Like, so the the really basic ones are. Uh, and by the way, these aren't all psychotic symptoms at all, but they're hints that there might, might be going on. Um, so, well, extreme ones first of all. There's some people who who feel that there's parasites in their body, and they'll drink small amounts of bleach um, to get rid of the parasites. So they feel that there is something living within their body mm-hmm. that uh, you know doctors can't find or whatever but but it's in them and so there are people who you know sell unfortunately bleach that are you know very diluted bleach and they will drink this very bad for you to try to get rid of this parasite that is colonizing your body um, others but are fitness whenever someone is exercising a lot of athletes people who push their bodies so far there is a morbid excitation it's called that's the old term for it a morbid excitation there's a too muchness in the body Mm -hmm. and they have to work out not an hour not an hour three times a week but four or five hours a day they'll just push to get this Mm -hmm. excitation is too muchness out some writers people who write um just like you know if you've ever met someone who can write very easily a 10 page email right just just this this writing that just comes out comes out there's sometimes that's a way in which a person feels there's a too muchness in their body sometimes people who vomit a lot right throw up Mm -hmm, lots mm -hmm. and lots oh that's what i've I've seen the well i know you're speaking about a separate thing but i've seen people vomit and there's a like black they vomit black like very black Gross oh, you're becoming thing. back to exorcisms now. That's straight that back. Yeah. Exorcism. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's just funny how they, mm. they do what what you're mm. you're speaking mm. about it in a metaphorical way, but yeah, it is. Yeah, a thing. Yeah, no, because like I know some people who they like again. There's not really any medical reason, right, that they can be found, and yet they there's something in them they cannot digest, and they need to throw it uh-huh. up. They need to get it out of their body. And all of these are experiences of a type of exorcism. They're all attempts to excavate, to get rid of a, a, a sense of an overproximity of, of something that cannot be named, that cannot be symbolized, that cannot be put into kind of like a symbolic form mm-hmm. and remove it. And, yeah. and by the way, people with insomnia, this is very big. It's a lot of people at night, they're fine during the day, completely fine during the day. And then at night, as soon as they go to sleep, 
they start feeling the over proximity of this something that can't quite be named that threatens to uh, dissolve their sense of subjectivity, their sense of self. And they'll name it, it'll be attached to lots of things, but none of those things will be it because none of those things should be that much. So a person might go, oh, I had an argument last week with this person. And like, that's not a big deal. It shouldn't feel like whenever, it, you, you see ch children have psychosis, all children are psychotic, <laughs> right? Before you get through psychosis. And when you see a child being shouted at and then they feel terror, they feel their whole world is falling apart and it's only they were shouted at, like, you know. Right. But then some adults, they, they have that. They don't want to be shouted at. They're good as gold in school. They do everything right because th it's not that they're afraid that someone's going to shout at them. They have this sense that if they're shouted at, they will have that terror, that experience of horror. So that's if the scaffolding will break and yeah. the, the yeah the demon will take over. Yes, and so the, uh, someone like Winnicott calls that a primal agony, which I really like that phrase, a primal agony. It's this, it's primal, like primordial, like like some horror thing that is from the past that you can't quite name, but you feel is looking at you. That's why a lot of people who have had psychotic breaks feel they're being looked at, surveilled, their thoughts are being read. Someone, because there's there's something that that is invading them. There's cameras everywhere. There's mm -hmm. there's listening things everywhere. Um, it's it's because they feel that there's something that is too close. Yeah, and it's also these can be normal people. Like oh, yeah. these can. This is a, a bit so that degree of it, I guess, is a pretty common thing like you're yeah. saying a huge portion of people can relate to it i was reminded of when i saw my uh when i saw what i jokingly referred to but only half jokingly as the demon on the wall uh back in the day i was five years ago I and mean, i was uh i remember that sort of uh it was a shadow person i guess is what it's called uh and you can put you can search it on wikipedia uh, to find out all sorts of stuff about it. But the experience of it was so legitimately real that to this day, I cannot in good faith chalk it up to just a dream or just a, uh, some other type of fantasy that I was experiencing. Like it was a as real as day and it was so terrifying. And it was like uh, I was in bed and I felt physically felt something you know lay next to me and uh and and get in bed and this was at a very dark time i would say in my life and then i i felt it get off and when i opened my eyes it was like on the wall across from me crawling up like spider-man very slowly creeping up the wall and it was like could see like it was a person that could have just been dressed in black but there was no discerning features it was just a, a silhouette of pure black and that's probably the closest i've ever come to some sort of what age were you when that happened <laughs> I was like 25, 24, 25, 26, 25 maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so pretty old. And it was like I was not like I was familiar with um, – I, was, I wasn't like a devout Christian at that time, but I was certainly um, – uh, and I was getting into things like psychoanalysis and all that stuff and like learning about loosely about these things and these ideas – but um, it didn't it didn't dissuade me from the uh, palpability of the whole experience. Yeah. And that, that's why, I mean, it's interesting you bring that up because like everybody, most people have occasionally these, these types of experiences. And that's why I said like at the beginning, it's, you, if you kind of have had it once or twice, that's not enough to kind of like go, oh, I have this structure. It's kind of like if it haunts you. Right. Yeah, there, there's actually, I wouldn't say I have that. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, yeah, you're probably kind of more a neurotic structure, you know, a non-pathological. <laughs> so it's just a stupid joke, and I say it every time. Like, it's gonna, I hope someone likes it at some point. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, yeah, I've had similar experiences, and when you're younger, often you can have those types of experiences. Yeah, as um, a kid, I mean, that's you're, you're in like what the magical phase of life then yeah. where everything truly is giants and monsters and angels and demons. Yeah. So it's a very, it's, it makes it real. And you haven't been able to like for it, for a very young child who hasn't yet been able to symbolize their experience. Like life is traumatic. So like a trauma is basically an unsymbolizable, a kind of like intrusion. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah. do you think it's like a psychosomatic, like the psych, the illnesses that 
many of the illnesses, or I guess, I don't know, illness is the right word, but like, like, is there stages to it where it's like, you, sometimes you will have a sore throat, a chronic sore throat. You hear about all these stories in the early days of, of the psychoanalysis world mm -hmm. where they start talk, doing talk therapy and they find that it's like you said, because they can't seem to speak, they don't feel like they can talk or get something out. They don't feel like they're being heard. And so they can, or whatever. Yeah. And they, if you find out through the course of dialogue, do you think that there is like, this is a stage before where it's like, that particular thing that that contradiction or whatever it is that anxiety inside them hasn't yet found a physical uh thing to piggyback on and so the idea of like exorcisms is essentially like it's a healthy body physically but like that inner anxiety has nowhere to go so it just like jams up the whole system and they yeah. end up contorting and being freaky yeah absolutely but and and that's like so there's the neurotic version so the neurotic version is what you're describing is something that you you can't speak, you know, you're free. Oh, of, it's yeah. a neuro, I see. It's a neurotic structure that would lead to the psychosomatic thing and the psychotic Psychotic. structure would lead more to a, I get. Yeah, it's almost like, so the psychotic structure leads to the real. So a, a neurotic might go, I feel like I'm drowning and my throat gets tight sometimes. And, and as soon as they say, I feel like I'm drowning, right? That's a key, right? Why are they using that phrase? And you analyze that. But for someone who's, who's close to a psychotic break or is in one, it's like, they, they, they don't feel like they're drowning, they are drowning, mm -hmm. right? They're like, um, I'm sort of, you know, they'll, there'll be experiences where they'll feel surrounded by water. Like it'll be, but it'll, it won't be a metaphor. It'll be real. Like mm -hmm. that's where the, the idea is they, it returns in the real. So for a, a, someone with a psychotic structure, things happen in reality. They're not metaphors. They really happen. They're like, yeah, really, really there. Um, and the too muchness. Pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. And the two. So I've got some friends who who suffer from th this too muchness, and it's like this is the the only problem with it. Joe Beretta. Joe Beretta. Yeah, Joe Beretta. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that you brought him up. Yeah, just, like, just threw threw him under the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you know, privately he was saying. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, I, uh, yeah, we were, I was like, how funny it would be if like, we started name, just I started start name dropping rather people. Put people's names and in. I was like, you say a couple of friends, I was like, I'm not going to say me, that just, uh, but so yeah, someone innocent, we'll go with Joe Barrett. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think psychotic at all, you know, but, um, yeah, so, so it, the only problem with this is that, is that it can destabilize your life. It's like where you feel always that there's something that's about to happen or could happen that's going to destroy anything. So it might be losing a parent, it might be losing a friend, or it might be losing a job that you think, if that happens, I am done. It's not even that would be bad. Yeah. That would be, I'd be unhappy. It's like this, my entire world done. could fall apart, done. And there's just this, in, this feeling of threat that is, that mm -hmm. is hanging over you. Um, and that, and that you want to get that out of you. You want to, you want to name it. You want to get it. So it's parasites in the body. It's a demon. It's, uh, it's, it's too much energy that needs to be worked out. QAnon. You know, yeah. I mean, any <laughs> conspiracy theories are, um, neurotics love conspiracy theories, but psychotics are generally like really, really believe them, really take yeah. them. Yeah. Like really, you know, on all sides. If you've got a, a conspiracy theory, because a conspiracy theory is generally the big other is there's something that you can't find anywhere, but it's everywhere, right? So it's like God, right? You, it's nowhere, but it's everywhere. Like the obvious example is, a, you know, the Jewish conspiracy, mm -hmm. right? They're kind of nowhere, but everywhere. Some deep state, deep state, you know, there's lots of different names for these things of, mm -hmm. that are looking, that are everywhere, that are kind of like uh, invasive. It's the surveillance uh, controlling everything. Um, which and is if only, if only they, they, they could be exposed and they will be. Yeah. Yeah. The storm <laughs> is coming or whatever is the it? phrase is. Yeah. What is that from the, Q, the, the QAnon? The storm is coming. Oh, I don't know. I'm not I don't know much about QAnon, but I do know it's a, it's a conspiracy theory or a set of conspiracy theories. Is that right? Like yeah. A, Q, yeah. 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 A lot of child, uh, sex trafficking. Oh yeah. Um, so, but there's loads of them on all, all sides like that. There's conspiracy theories are not the preserve of any one group. Oh, you're looking up. I had, um, this is just an article I found uh, mm -hmm. called Exorcisms May Have Psychological Benefits. Ooh. 
A new take on psychology suggests that the centuries-old practice of an exorcism might have clear and useful psychiatric value in some specific circumstances. Psychologists and psychiatrists and psychotas and psychos and psycho blah, blah, are beginning to suggest that performing an exorcism on a person suffering from a mental illness might serve to help them on the road to recovery, especially if they're devoutly religious and firm believers in demonic possession. For those that believe their problem is because of a demon that's possessing them, an exorcism could be just what the doctor ordered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the basic Darian leader is very good on this. He wrote a book called "What Is Madness," and he's uh, he's he's a really good Lacanian. He's um, Nick Cave's analyst uh, and a very interesting guy. But uh, you know, he talks about um, you have to take seriously if a psychotic structure. You take seriously whatever the person believes, and you try to work with it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. There's you don't bother. You know, the, there's a self-cure dimension to it. So the, the one guy I remember doing an exorcism with, and uh, what you would do, this is before I'd done any education stuff, but you would get the demon to name itself. And so this yeah. is interesting. So from a psychoanalytic perspective, what you're doing is you're chipping away at the real by putting language to it. So this guy would say uh, rejection. When you say the real, do you mean the world in which the patient is living? Uh, yeah, the real. So the real in, psychoana- in structural psychoanalysis is the, the unnameable distortion that prevents you from uh, being um, having equilibrium. Yeah. Now, we all have the real. The real is always there. There's always something stopping us from having equilibrium. Um, but... The, so the real is, but yeah, the, so the real almost is some, some event, some unsymbolizable rock that is always going to be there for us, but it has different shapes for different people. Like for, uh, so for example, you might have been like really impacted by being sent to boarding school when you were young. Somebody else, it's connected to... Uh, the death of a family member when they were young. But this has distorted their reality. It's distorted their way of living, but they have different kind of shape. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. I kind of zoned out a little bit. Yeah, sorry. No, it's not your fault. No. It's my fault for not remaining <laughs> engaged. I just started thinking about exorcisms again. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking about uh, this, the, just how scary they are. Yeah. Uh, but that was where my head was. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, here's, here's a way but I, just, do, I did get the part about yeah. the real where it is uh, the thing that distorts and, and keeps yeah. it's the, the there's a lost the, object kind of deal for the person that they can't well not really a lost object but it's like the opposite of a lost object right it's the like the thing that they have to get rid of and then it'll be fine and then is that right and yeah, so you so name the thing you name it you put language to it the, the, there's a, I'm doing a talk on Saturday it'll be after this but I'm using Claude Levy Strauss as a starting point and he noticed so he was doing some research and um he was actually looking at someone else's research but there's a winnebago tribe um great lakes tribe mm-hmm. and this guy i think his name was radden noticed this is fascinating right? yeah no noticed i'm in that that uh he asked people to draw a map of the village right draw a map of your village and he noticed that depending on whether you were in one side of the community or the other, what's called the upper frety or the lower frety, you drew the map differently. So he asked someone for physical location physical or physical so location. A physical so location. They literally drew the map, but the two maps looked different. And uh, Radden didn't really talk much about it. So Levi, Le- Levi Strauss takes this up and says, This is very interesting. He says, Right, the usual re- ways to respond to this is. Either one of the maps is right or better than the other or a relativism that uh, all the maps are just subjective, right? The way that's you what map, it looks like to them and that's yeah. what it is. Yeah, so you can't argue that's their perspective. Yes, so you got relativism on one side, objectivism on the other. So like the other side, the objectivism is, oh, a more detailed map can, can bring them both together. And Levi-Strauss rejected them both. And he said, no, no, no. What the very way that you map social reality um the the a society the the fact that they don't fit together there's something that hasn't been symbolized that is going on in the society so and politically actually this is really interesting oh, i love it yep, yep yep yeah different people map social reality differently yep. and the truth isn't 
on one side or the other, the truth or the real is what is the distortion in the social community, in the, situ in the, in the society that is causing these mutually exclusive, incommensurable ways of mapping um, the antagonism within society. That's the real. The real is the antagonism that creates all of these very disparate ways mm -hmm. of conceptualizing space. With truth in, in all of them, I would probably say, right? Like, you're, it is a, tr well, or you're saying, what are you saying? Am I not? Yeah, well, so Levi Strauss would say that there's, there's, a, there's, there's not, it's not tr so much truth in all of them, but rather that these different ways of mapping social reality speak of some crisis or something, a problem yes. within the social situation that hasn't yet been named. Sim symbolically. Symbolically, yes. And so if you take that as an individual, the individual has different desires and conflicts. And um, the real is the, the fact that they don't all fit together, that we are this. So yeah. fun. Oh, by, can I give you a good example, by the way? I, I thought of this today. I have a friend. And she, this is a long time ago. Joe Beretta. Yeah, Joe Beretta. <laughs> so uh, she was at this party and she met this guy, uh, was talking to him and he was introduced and they got on really well. And then uh, about a week later, just happened to bump into him, right? And she was like, oh, how's it going? Synchronicity. What's that? Synchronicity. Synchronicity, right? Bumps into him and she goes, oh, how's it going? She says, oh, your name's, it's Willie, isn't it? And he goes, no, it's Dick, right? That, wonderful i know wonderful story wonderful yeah it's not good <laughs> that's a great example of two discourses happening within one speech right because immediately everybody knows that they're thinking about the penis <laughs> yep. yeah but they're just exchanging well, the name <laughs> at least one of them is right yes exactly yeah. whoever switched the name from dick to willie <laughs> was thinking about penis yes yeah so she was like she did Poor it. dick is just stick there stuck there with his dick in his hand being like it's just yeah. my name man i don't know what to tell you i know that's probably so willie no it's dick no it's like okay we, now we know that there is this other discourse going on within the discourse. That sounds like a peep show uh, line. I know, it was very, very funny. I'm trying to find, um, if I can find a quote, it was something that, uh, as cliche as this is, it was something that Jung said. Um, I know, that was one I was gonna send you, but I didn't send you. Um, there was something about what Jung said about uh, a good psychologist does not, um, has to recognize that in the psychosis of their of the patient is a kernel of truth and if you fail to recognize that then it is on you basically oh yeah there's always a truth yeah and i keep truth. thinking about that with like i keep watching these videos of the 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 sort of um smackdown i guess of the fbi um uh arresting all these people and you're seeing it's just crazy too that we're living. We're living in insane times that everyone has a cell phone that you can film everything and upload oh, yeah. on it, and you can just see all of it is nutty. But there's all these videos of these, you know, MAGA rioters being like in tears because they. And I saw this one of a guy who, who finds out he was put on a no-fly list, and he's freaking out in the airport. So naturally, everyone's got their stuff out or their cell phones out, and he's he's screaming about um. He's like, do you see what they do to us? Do you see how they treat us? Do you see what they do to us? And he like kept repeating that over and over again. And of course, you know, it's like Reddit and everyone's on like, this is what you get. This is, you know, you storm the Capitol, you do it right, you do this, you invade, you trespass, blah, blah. But I was like, if you look at that, if you look at what he's saying and you just believe him for a second, then you go, okay, so he's going, he's going, look at what they do to us. There's all sorts of stuff to unpack there. Oh yeah, where it's like there's some kind of something going on where he's he he's being truthful in his emotions. So it's it's I felt really uh, just sad. I I would I didn't wouldn't go so far as to say I felt bad for him, but definitely I felt bad for a, a large group of people who I think are, are feeling uh, maybe not justly but legitimately. Um, ostracized yeah i mean yeah this is what i want to talk about on saturday is that like and why i want to use levy strauss because levy strauss goes right you have got to whenever you're looking at an organization uh you look at the different ways in which different participants map the social antagonism and the funny thing is in the winnebago 
tribe, this is fascinating, right? The upper Freddy, right, which are the ones who were in control, they drew a circle and they had all of the houses in the middle with the, the clan lodges. And then they had another circle, which was cleared land before you got to virgin forest. So basically, it's, it, this is called a concentric model, which is the circle. Mm -hmm. We're all in the circle together. And then there's the external yep. environment. I love whereas that, the virgin, the, virgin forest. Virgin forest, yeah. Oh, yeah. Whereas, whereas the lower Freddy, they drew a line. They drew one circle with a line through it. It's called a diametric model. And they had the upper Freddy on one side and the lower Freddy on the other. And so what was interesting was one group were saying, we're all in this together against nature. And the other were saying, no, there's an antagonism between the, the more powerful and the yeah. less powerful. And it did remind me of that issue whenever, whenever a lot of celebrities came out when it, with COVID and said, we're all in this together. They, they drew a concentric model of, of social antagonism, which is we're all in this together against external nature. But then other people who drew a line down the middle, a diametric model, said, no, you've got these massive houses, these pools and jacuzzis, you are all protected. There's a social antagonism within the village. We're not, we're not all together against an antagonism that's non-social. There's a social antagonism. Yeah, you're not with us. Yes, yeah. We're not, I'm not your team. You wouldn't consider me a team member. I live in Oklahoma, and I work uh, at an Olive Garden, and you're going to try to tell, comfort me because yeah. we're against something, united against something? Yeah. So then, so then uh, what someone like well, Levi Strauss would say, or I would say using Levi Strauss's work, is that there is an unsymbolized real. There's a, there's a social distortion that is causing these, these uh, mutually exclusive, incommensurable ex explorations of the world. And um, I would put that down to you know, alienation and, and uh, uh, lack of so, um, financial stability mm -hmm. and lo lots of issues in terms of that. But that's, that's the real... Uh, which is kind of interesting. So, I love that. That's very nice. I mean, yeah. I don't want to, it, it makes my sympathy go like two or three yards further yeah. than where it normally would, but it still and, stops yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> so, yeah. But he, well, here's, it might, this might make you even more sympathetic, right? The yeah. definition of ideology, right? Ideology is what covers over the real. So what ideology tries to do is it tries to either take one position over the other and say, oh, if, if just we did, we got rid of the other bunch, everything would be great, right? So the real is not, it's just a contingent thing. We get rid of the other, everything will be fine. Or it tries to displace it. So it tries, basically, it, it's always rendering it contingent, something you can get rid of. So anyone who's basically, like, the, the point of ideology critique is to let the real speak. And the point of psychoanalysis is to let the real speak. And the point of exorcism is to let the real speak. So whenever I was asking this guy, what is your name? And the, 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 the demon, right, was communicating and speaking back. In, in a very literal way, you're letting the real speak. Mm -hmm. And this guy was very ostracized in his school, didn't fit in, um, was someone who had kind of various things would meant that he wasn't accepted among his community. And this experience of speaking the real was, was, was very, very beneficial for his life after the exorcism. Um, and in the same way, I'm like, politically, I wasn't going to go here, but I'm like, we have to let the real speak. That's the Hegelian thing. It's like you we weren't going look. there, but by you saying this, I'm allowing the real to speak within you instead of masking <laughs> yes. the ideology of exorcism. Yes, because yeah. <laughs> my my concern is that everybody wants to have an easy answer to get rid of the what Le, what Levi Strauss might call, or or he wouldn't call it this, but it basically is a an unsymbolized uh, antagonism within social life that is being obscured. There's, a, there's, an un, there's something that isn't being spoken. And for the individual who's being exercised, the individual, they feel something that they cannot put into words, a too muchness. And sometimes it feels like a threat to their yeah. existential reality. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um. I'm reminded of something that my good friend Joe Beretta, mm -hmm. name drop, once the said. Psycho. Uh, so, absolute psycho. <laughs> uh, he was saying, uh, he was listening, we were talking the other day on um, 
a chat, a group chat, me, him, and uh, another guy, Steve, uh, who's a pervert, has yeah. a pervert yeah. structure. 100%. <laughs> uh, he was saying, Joe was saying that he was listening to um, a Bill Hader interview about how Bill Hader would, um, uh, who I love and adore, um, he, I don't know who he is. Uh, he is Barry on uh, Showtime, I think, oh. or HBO, I think. Mm. I've seen that. I, saw, I watched some of the SNL. Episodes. Uh, yeah. Barry? Oh. Not uh, the show, Barry. It's, the it's TV a television show, show Tele- Barry. Yeah, yeah. Have you not seen Barry? I did years ago, like the first season. Second I saw season. a couple, or, but I can't remember. I mean, I remember enjoying it, but it's just... Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, Bill Hader was saying, because he, he did so much, um, I would say probably he's a very neurotic individual, and he... Um, would name his anxiety. He would he give it a name, and it would allow him to function uh, when he was feeling particularly anxious. Now I know that this is it's interesting. Well, here's what's interesting to me. I think that is not like a psychoanalytic um, treatment. I mean, but it's almost more. I would say like a, almost a cognitive behavioral type of thing. In my at least from what I can tell. But it's so similar because in an exorcism to name the real or to name the undefinable thing, which I guess that's the difference, is effective. But it's like I've heard this sort of trick and it does feel like a little bit of a life hack or like a self-care yeah. thing to name the impulses and the habits that you have in a way that like an- like makes them characters, makes them like anthropomorphizes them and allows you to kind of process them a little bit um (laughs) i've heard good things pretty much in every aspect of this every version of this um and it just cracks me up because i'm like what a funny thing that humans do that we that we can choose to do and it's just entering into a fiction that allow a, a little silly fiction that allows the weirdness to have a place that makes uh sense which is pretty cool yeah, yeah, no, that's a kind of uh, so much of the talking cure is it's called a talking cure because it's about putting symbolic a dimension or bringing a symbolic dimension to trauma, you know, yeah. in various kind of different ways. Um, oh yeah, I was thinking of this. Here's a here's a concrete example because a lot of this is very abstract. Um, because of why the real so important. Imagine a couple, right, and they're going out. They've been, they've been married for twenty years. And, you know, one of them's having an affair uh, and the other one's kind of out all the time, right? And it's kind of known. It's not known, known, but it's known, right? Everybody knows it's not going well. And the couple know. They don't want to know what they know. Um, but there's, there's, but they, it, like, it's kind of obvious something's going on. So that not knowing what you know is, could be described as an experience of, of the real in that mm-hmm. relationship. Now... Everything in the relationship covers over it in different ways. Pretend it's all not happening, it's contingent, things can get better, right, whatever. The relationship then just keeps going for another 10 years, just pottering along with this unspoken dimension. But the unspoken dimension does speak. So it comes out in the kid having anorexia. It comes out in uh, you know health issues with the mother and, and the father overworking or whatever it is. It, it obviously, it, the, the real returns. Sorry. Yeah. Now then, if this couple gets to the point where they try to put words to the real, one of two things will happen. Either they will break up um, or they'll reconfigure their relationship. The relationship will not continue as it is. Or when, maybe stop one of them probably stop the affair probably yeah well that's going to happen yeah either that's going to happen or they're, or they're going to go off like basically the only oh, thing they would have to reconfigure i thought you just yeah. re- the, their relationship would have to reconfigure to accommodate the okay gotcha, yeah. gotcha. but but and it might re- like that's the funny thing you don't know what's going to happen because yeah, no. by the way a lot of people break up with individuals but don't break up with their relationship style so what they do is they break up with individuals but they don't break up with how they go out with people you can break up with your relationship style without breaking up with a person and that's more radical right so you break that's up interesting. With the, yeah so it's it's a way of, now you may break up with the person, but you're actually breaking up with the way in which you relate to others and that's obviously a much more radical form of breakup which can allow a, re, a couple to reconfigure their relationship so when but so when you bring the real up 
you, the relationship cannot remain the same. That's the only thing that's definitely not going to happen. It's not going to remain the same. They're going to break up. They're going to fix things and whatever. That's, what, that's why the real is so important in, in politics and in individual life is when you allow the real to speak, it's, you will not be the same as a result. It, it changes things fundamentally. Things shift. So in society... You can't go back to the way things were. Like a lot of people talk about, I want to go back to you know the way things were before Trump, for example. But the way things were before Trump was what gave rise to what happened. You know, there's yeah. um, there's there's no. If things there, were great before then, we wouldn't have had them. Yeah, there's there's a whole yeah there and so and you know I'm so critical of the Democrats, but uh, so the um the real when you let the real speak, it cracks everything, and the only thing is that the society or the individual or the couple can no longer be the same. And it will be better. It'll be better just by definition because what's currently going on is shit. So the real becomes a very important thing. So in politics, ideology critique is the removal of the obfuscation mm -hmm. to reveal the real. In psychoanalysis, the job is to remove the justifications we have to avoid a confrontation with the real and um yeah and uh, yeah so anyway and then in the spiritual world is, yeah. a exorcism yes you're kind of like you're letting the real so for him that guy i remember this is 30 years ago he um what guy what's that what which guy oh the guy who i was one of the guys was who i was doing exorcism yeah yeah, with, yeah. Speaking. i want to hear more about that oh, yeah he when he was able to put language to his feelings and by the way it wasn't just his experience in school he was talking about something further back but just putting some words to it through this funny it wasn't him speaking you know it was speaking through him his eyes were like back in the back of his head and he was growling and he was speaking these words and as these words were speaking you kind of felt that there was this cathartic mm -hmm. event going on um and that whatever happened he'd be able to face his school life in a in a in a healthier way in the aftermath of it. Hmm. So. I like that a lot. Yeah. I mean, I still, they still freak me out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I could watch uh, an exorcism at this point in my life, and I don't know that it would not. I guess maybe I'm just too. Uh, no, I think I just see it, and I'm like, I know it, I could have in my head, they're naming the real. There's there's something in them that screech. There's something in them that they can't get out. A too muchness, and then I would that would last about twenty seconds, <laughs> and then I would go, nope, that's a demon. I'm out of here. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Not today, Satan. Goodbye. Uh, so I, I do I do uh, appreciate and I, I agree with what's happening because I and it does you see it happen and it is amazing these transformations that can take place where people can walk away feeling better about things um, in those types of very strange trance-like uh, episodes. But I don't know what, um, what, how that, how you expound upon that on a societal level. I can understand yeah. an individual going through that and getting better, but when part of the society itself is collectively possessed by this sort of unspeakable thing, um, then, then the, yeah. yeah, then the job of the political you moved theorist. To Canada. Yeah, what's that? You moved to Canada. You moved to Canada. Yeah. Well, this is this is what I. Oh, this is the danger we're in. This is why I said to you, I, I might move more towards politics in the next five years. Is I think the role of the political theorist is to name the real, and as you name the real in a society and bring it to the surface, it has a ripple effect across all of the different groupings within the society because all of the social antagonisms that different groups feel are um, connected to this unsymbolized real. If you can name it, if you can bring it to the surface, what you will find, this is weird, but this is what happened, say, in Christianity when Paul brings Jew and Gentile together. Those are two groupings that would have been inconceivable to imagine but when you name the, uh, the the social distortions you will find that people that you thought could never be unified find a way of articulating their their alienation um, in a way that is that kind of transcends all of the boundaries but it's not because it's because you're naming the real 
it's because you're 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 naming what is unnameable and you know i've got some theories as to what that is um folks you're hearing it here first this is the uh premier pivot for uh peter rollins no i mean before i I get canceled (laughs) yeah Yeah. do it now before you get canceled yeah but you know what getting canceled is what makes people then get to have entire careers i mean is that right yeah sometimes it works yeah the the grifters are making so much money but it has been fun seeing them in the past couple weeks the ben shapiro tweet did you hear about the ben shapiro so shapiro brilliant man uh gets on twitter and after saying a couple things that were like yeah it's bad to storm the capitol building he throws out this tweet that's like every human i know owns zip ties it's not that big of a deal plus stop making them big deals something like that which is just a weird thing to say every human i know owns zip ties because who was he asking people how does he know but he's referring to the pictures of rioters in the Capitol building who had like the, the zip tie cuffs, mm. you know, the, the police use, which are different than regular zip ties. But um, a guy, Mike Drucker, replied to him and he goes, Ben, normally I would make a joke at you, but I'm going to come at this honestly. There is a difference between zip ties that are used as handcuffs by insurgents storming the Capitol building and the zip ties that your wife uses to tie you to a chair so you can watch her have sex with other men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. That's, and that's I quite was funny. Like, and it's, you know, it's, that's a funny... It's right there. You know, but it's, I mean, and I'd yeah. heard that being... I mean, and people love to come at Ben Shapiro for that, but I also love to see it happen. <laughs> I love to see it. I Like, he's just trying so hard to be cool and it doesn't work. But anyway... I don't... Yeah, I, I should... I don't watch him very... But I do have my ones that I like on all sides, the ones yeah. that I do watch. Funny enough, I... He's just somebody I haven't, but the, I like Eric Weinstein. Weinstein. Oh, Weinstein. Yeah, Eric Weinstein's intro. Like, so the ones that I like, like, are people like Jimmy Dore. I like Jimmy Dore, and I like, um, I like Chris Hedges, and but I, but I'll keep a keep an eye on Weinstein. I'll keep an eye on Tim Pool. Um, well, wait, really, will you, Tim Pool? Tim Pool. Yeah, I think I, you know, I find it like you got to have Tim a Pool. Tim Pool. Uh, you, Am you I thinking of the same Tim Pool you're thinking of? I think so, or maybe not. Beanie. Beanie, yes. Beanie yeah, Boy? Yeah, Beanie Boy. Yeah. You like him? Well, no, I, I, well, I, as in I watch him. So Jimmy Dore. Oh, I see. Keep an eye. You got to keep an eye on him. Yeah. You know, but also because I, I like to see, I do like him actually in the sense of like, you know, he's very different from Jimmy Dore or Chris Hedges oh, or Red Scare or Estranged. But Red Scare got uh, D, D. I saw that. I'm very, I'm very nervous because I'm a big, I'm a big free speech guy. So I'm nervous. I'm, I'm going like, how did Red Scare Get, I mean, also, what's left? Um, Amy Therese <laughs> got bad, but she's she's too much. I don't know if you know Amy Therese. Yeah. Amy Therese is great. She's just too aggressive. She's there's there's a too muchness to, to Amy well, Therese. So she experiences really? a too muchness. Yeah, I and, had. Uh, uh, she needs an exorcism. Uh, I uh, clicked on some of the Red Scare stuff because I know uh, it had been recommended, and I I found myself. I was like, I don't know anything about these these people and i think it's super weird that they're getting kicked off or whatever because they're leftists and then i was like well of course you know i know the whole whatever but then i was i this is the funny thing the left and the right are both getting kind of kicked off you have to be you know it's it's only a, cer- a kind of a certain breed of um kind of like a look man no one likes the heels on the loaf of bread you know what i mean you gotta mm. cut off the ends just leave them <laughs> just, get, just get those nice centrists uh, yeah. but that just a joke i don't care um I, i'm consuming news all day i don't know what's going on i'm but surprised I, that dasha and anna got i heard about it just yesterday or today um, and i was surprised at that I was yeah. surprised almost to the point that it, I'm assuming a, some kind of misunderstanding, but I, I Googled a, uh, not Google, I, I YouTubed their names and there was this interview um, from Infowars of one of oh, them. Yeah, yeah, that's Dasha. That was pretty, that's classic. <laughs> so Eat the rich, good. that's so good. That, that's what, that's kind of what got them and, going. Like, that's she's what, like, really? Yeah, yeah. It's so like, because <laughs> she's like sipping a, a like cocktail in the middle of the street and she's just like, what are you saying? What? And they're like, 
do you not do you what do you, do you support universal health care when you know what's going on in venezuela and they're eating rats while the the rich people and she's like venezuela she's like i just want people to have health care yeah. like, and i want the government to pay for it because i think it's a human right and she's like they're like well you're not answering the question and she's like what question? She's like, there's no question. Like, well, you're going to support. You're, and she's like, yeah. And she's like, you know, you guys have worms for brains. Yeah. You know? I was just like, this is so yeah, funny. The cadence just of just that laid back. Just like, no. They're very <laughs> laid back. There's a really enjoy, like they're fun. You know, they got good instincts. I think they've got very good instincts. Uh, political instincts. Political um, instincts. That's the name of your next podcast. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, yeah, how are we doing? I 50 was, minutes. Oh, yeah. What's got that? Oh, no. Well, you know, but we this is, we'll leave this for another one because I was thinking, I interesting to um to talk about what madness is oh yeah we could do a madness on let's do a madness episode then and, and or yeah. yeah that seems like a yeah we could expand i can come i can come with some hot google links for that one oh yeah more on that later folks thank you so much for joining us um m- m- I have to go meet a plumber. So if it seems like what happened, is there a problem in the house? Uh, it's just a, I think a previous plumber messed up and uh, you know, it's a whole other episode of the podcast. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, basically we've been hand washing dishes and which is very therapeutic and I really like doing it. So it, and like anything that we deal with, we don't really, we take a while to deal with it. But, um, anyway, it's all just fun little, it's my, uh, hobby now to just try to fix stuff. Like you're a, well, you guys broken. have got a house. That's amazing. So cool, like, man. yeah, it's I just really beautiful. Everything is, like, it's, shit. it's getting there and mm-hmm. it's starting to feel like a real, uh, real home and it's very, very nice. So, um, I'm going to go let a roto rooter guy in and see if he can fix whatever the previous plumber did to get water to the dishwasher. Cause I've tried all of the things that Google suggested and, uh, I'm very good at knowing my limits on these things. This and is the problem with Google. Cause I good friend, Daniel, um, he's away at the moment and he has chickens and he wired up, I'm guessing through watching YouTube tutorials, this chicken coop and he made it with a door that opens and closes and with a automatic feeder that feeds them and, all of this that he can control from his mobile phone. So he's away for a few days. Obviously, it all goes wrong. Yeah. So I go round at 8 o'clock at night, pitch black. I'm having to catch chickens and roosters, <laughs> which is like... Like I, a game of Zelda? Yeah. Like you're a- <laughs> and, then, and then climb up because the whole thing, he's built up on stilts and I have to climb up on stilts and then the the, the ladders uh-huh. fall from beneath me so I'm holding on so you're just chicken. in the chi- now you're just living in the chicken coop yeah <laughs> I was there for three days yes I'll just stay here at least the automatic feeder was working there. yeah um, oh yeah so yeah there was sometimes it doesn't work the YouTube God. tutorials please please if you have to do that again film it or mm-hmm. something that's how I am with the raccoons every night I wake up and I'm like I'm gonna see one I'm gonna see one because they're, they're still anyway that's another podcast we'll talk about my raccoon journey yeah one day all right everybody um thanks for listening thanks for watching appreciate you being on the journey with us thank you